This video is going to be about the next most sophisticated model that you encounter in the world of statistics. It's commonly named ANOVA, but it actually stands for Analysis of Variance. Despite its name, it tells us something about means. So we'll start with a description of the model in plain words because its name is a little misleading to newcomers in the world of statistics. Then we'll write out a statistics description of the model. I'll try to draw us a nice visualization of this model. Lucky for us, it fits the same pattern that we've seen, generally the same pattern that we've seen for the two sample t-test. And then we will once again, show me the data. We'll do a little bit in R to try to look at how this model applies to uh, is applied in the world of statistics. So let's start out with a description of analysis oops, of variance, which often is abbreviated to ANOVA. So we'll start out with words. ANOVA is a model, statistical model, that, let's say, enables, enables us to compare groups, means, when there are more than two groups. There is more than two groups. So essentially, this is the natural extension from a two-sample t-test to more than two groups. And in fact, you're only really limited by the number of data points you have. You cannot have more groups than you have data points. So if you had sufficient data, you could have 15 different groups, and you could compare all 15 different groups. Now, statistically, we assume that we have some numerical data, which we call Y, and we assume we have capital N observations of some numerical variable. And we assume these data are all independent and identically distributed following the normal distribution. Now, once again, we don't actually care if the data follow the normal distribution, because as long as you have enough data, then in the end, we get that the sample means for each group are approximately normally distributed, as long as we have enough data. That's a key point here. But generally, uh, you will, because you're not collecting too few observations, you want a lot of data. And so the assumption of normality is really kind of innocuous. It doesn't really hurt anything because the central limit theorem kind of picks us up to make this assumption more reasonable. So in the same way, we assumed that the different groups were really kind of group means relative to the first group. For the two sample t-test, we'll do that again here. So beta naught is going to be the first group mean. Beta one is going to be the second group's offsets. So that is, if you have data from group one, then beta naught plus beta one is group one's mean. Now, theoretically, we have more groups. Now, if you have data from group two, that means the mean for group two is beta naught plus now, your data are from group two, not group one, so x1 should be equal to zero. Plus, you have data from x2, so x2 is equal to one. So it's beta naught plus beta two. And in fact, they generally write this out as you have k groups, all with the same variance. And so when you observe data from group K, whatever that group might be, all of these other X values will take on the value zero. 
xk will take on the value 1 because your data is from group k. And the group mean for the kth group will be beta k plus beta naught. So thinking about these values, x's, they are indicator variables for each group. They only take on 1 or 0, depending on which group group's data it is you're looking at. So this is getting to be a fairly complicated model, but I think when you visualize it, it's not so bad. So we're going to visualize analysis of variance named ANOVA. So let's just assume, this is already getting out of hand, we'll just actually assume we have four groups. Let's name our groups G0, G1, G2, and G3. And the idea is that each group is going to have a mean, I don't know, just for fun, let's say group zero is the biggest. So the mean for group zero is going to be beta naught. And now group one has a mean that actually consists of beta naught plus beta one. So in this case, for group one, x1 is equal to one, and x2 is equal to zero, and x3 is equal to zero. Okay. Now, the detail here is that beta 1 actually shows up as negative, which is to suggest the difference between the zeroth group's mean and the first group's mean is a negative value. Well, that's totally fine. We can, in fact, have the second group's mean be even lower and the third group's mean be even lower. But notice all the group's means are all relative to the zeroth group. Now, the reason for that is because you want these indicator variables to appropriately knock out these other groups such that you're not using them to define group two's mean. You only want to define group two's mean relative to the zeroth group and an appropriate offset for group two. So let's try that one more time. For the third group's mean, you have data from group three. So the indicator variable for group one is zero. The indicator variable for group two is zero. The indicator for um, group three is one, in this case that you have data from group three. And in that case, if you scroll back to our original equation, we now have a mean for group three, that consists of the initial group's mean plus an appropriate offset for group three. Now, the trick is that each of these is indeed a conditional density. Each of these is an expectation of a conditional density. It gets a little cumbersome to write all of these out. But I'll just give you this first example right here and trust that you'll understand the rest of these are different means, expectations of the numerical variable y given these indicator variables take on specific values such that you're looking at data from a particular group. We're now up to the show me the data section. So let's go on to my website. Here it is. We'll look at the section meta and then look at the link named datasets. And on this page, we're going to go down to the dataset named MLB for baseball data. You can read about the dataset here, but mostly I'm going to be looking at different teams' salaries. No, let's look at by position. That seems more fun. I'll let you look at teams yourself. So teams is a variable here. You can use it yourself. I'm going to use position as the grouping variable on the x-axis. 
and salary as the y-axis variable. So let's get the raw data set, copy the URL to it, and now here is the framework for the code we used in the last video. Now the reason I'm keeping this up is just to show you how nice this kind of awkward syntax is. All you gotta do is change your data set around, change the y-axis variable, change the x-axis variable position and the data set baseball, and out you have a new plot that shows you box plots representing the original distributions from which the data came. So it looks like first basemen tend to make the most on average. This is the median, but oh no, designated hitters do? Hmm, that's surprising to me. The designated hitters have the highest median salary but clearly there's some pitchers who just make a ton. Apparently some third baseman who makes a ton. It would be interesting to know who that third baseman is. Anyway, the code to make the box plots is really pretty easy. Now the box plots represent the original data. What we're more interested in is comparing the means because we know there's gonna be some possible outliers like this third baseman or some of these pitchers who make a lot of money. But we want to know for like the average pitcher, for the average first baseman, for the average third baseman, who makes more money on average. Oh, whoops. I haven't changed after I was telling you how easy it was to get all these variables right. I messed up the last one. So here it is. This is now a plot representing the confidence intervals for the average salaries. And you can see they're much more kind of uh, all in relatively in line with each other. These units must be in thousands or something. You'll have to go read the readme to double check. But it looks like first basemen and designated hitters tend to make the most money on average, but look how much variation there is. There's so few data points for designated hitters. We really don't have much confidence in the range. The range is so wide that suggests low information, little information um, about the true value of average salary for designated hitters. But for first basemen and pitchers, it really seems to be pretty informative about where the average salary is for these different baseball positions. Okay, hopefully this code wasn't so bad. You put the numerical axis, uh, numerical axis variable here. It's got to be numeric for this type of analysis. That's a tilde. And that's um, the grouping variable showing up after the tilde. So there's also a variable team in this baseball data set. You can check it out pretty easily.